My name is Christopher Litzinger. I come with some nice boring pronouns. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, someday I'll figure out what I'm doing in a post Twitter world, but uh, you can DM me and I'll probably get it eventually. Uh, and I'm pretty easy to find on the internet if you have follow up. So I'm here to talk about uh, product mindset. A lot of people think of uh, product management as a discipline that really is limited for consumer facing products. Understandable enough, but there's a lot of really great techniques and tools that we can apply in the DevOps space. They can actually apply to platforms, they can apply to services, they can even apply to processes. Um, I think these rules will help everyone in the room. I've found them really useful. I've run platform infrastructure teams for over 15 years, um, so I've seen some things too. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully you can learn from uh, mistakes I've made and along the way. So this is Sarah Blakely. She's going to introduce our first rule for us, which is simple but, av but available beats perfect vaporware. Now, this is kind of like a general agile principle. Hopefully everyone's kind of familiar with this. But this is so important if you're in the platform engineering space. Um, you know, again, for most of my career, I've done sort of systems that serve other engineers within the company. Uh, Sarah Blakely came up with a simple idea um, to, uh, she's, she's the founder of Spanx, if you're not familiar. Um, a simple idea from her own experience and she couldn't get investors, so she spent $5,000 of her own money to bootstrap it. Um, and by the end of a year, because she got no from a bunch of investors, she had to bootstrap her business, grow it slowly, and by the end of the first year, she was making $4 million in revenue. And she did that by, ooh, they're squeaky tween, Christopher. Um, she did that by manufacturing the product from her own house, doing everything she could to get her business going. I mean, I, I love the analog glory of this photo, right? Uh, uh, if she had had a bunch of investors throwing money at her company, this would not be a corporate artifact, right? But she's there with a big glass of wine, working from her sofa, making things happen. And if you're an internal cost center for your company, this is the way you need to think and operate. Um, absolutely simple partial tools out the door that get feedback from your customers will help you get feedback, improve, and there's really no other way for back-end engineering teams. So rule number two is make it self-service. So anyone here barbecue? Anyone here willing to admit that they barbecue with gas? <laughs> um, so uh, when I was a kid, getting propane was a real ordeal. You had to go to this janky propane dealer in the middle of nowhere. It was literally down a bumpy dirt road where I lived. Um, and you would have to find the person who worked there who was often like sleeping around the back. They had to find the key and fill your tank, and it was a real pain. But in 1994, this guy named um, Billy Prem, working at a big propane distributor, had this great idea to work with retailers like Walmart. And I think this, is, this particular picture is at a Lowe's. Um, to bring propane to the consumer where they already are. And so instead of going and getting your tank filled, you just trade your tank in, right? You go to the register, you wait for a little bit for someone to show up, and they are able to trade your tank in for you real quickly. And it just a massive improvement, a massive improvement on the experience for a customer of getting gas. And when we're able to do this, when we're able to find ways to make it simple to do the safe things and put guardrails around what a safe thing is, you'll note that they didn't just make the propane tank open to the public, right? <laughs> that would not be a safe thing. You put those guardrails around it, you make the safe things easy, and things get better for the consumer and things get better for your customer. And this is a really powerful tool. We're going to come back here in a little bit, but I'm going to move on to the next rule, which is to know your customers. And that sounds really obvious. And I think we all think we know our customers, but what I'm going to challenge you to do here is to question those assumptions. So I ran a very large platform. I had a really smart leader who was incredibly well-respected in the company who 
told us all a simple story at the beginning of my career with him, which was we're developing tools for incredibly smart engineers like us, right? So we went and did that. We did that for years. We built tools for incredibly smart engineers. And then, sorry, trying to keep my voice working. At the end, we were starting to question why we were having so many support issues, what we could do to become more efficient as an engineering team. And we started questioning that assumption. Why were we getting the questions that we were getting if we were actually serving all these incredibly smart software developers in our company? And what we realized was, in truth, the people who were being asked to implement their, their services into our system were not the engineers who had built the tools, but instead were the most recently hired contractor on the team. They didn't understand the operating environment. They had no idea what our product was. They didn't understand any of the questions that we were asking them in order to onboard into our system. And that insight helped us develop better onboarding processes to serve our actual customers instead of who we thought our customers were. The stories that we tell ourselves have a real sticky power, especially when they're comforting. And you have to dig into the data. Ask yourself the question, if we're right, what's that going to look like? Can we support that? Or maybe are we thinking a little wrong? So I told you we'd get back here. So. Once you've made it self-service, you need to find ways to make it more self-service. This is a new innovation. I love this innovation, so I don't barbecue much, but I have a pizza oven that runs on propane. Saturday night's pizza night at my house every week, pretty much. And what happens almost inevitably is that I start to make the pizza and the can kicks. Then I've got to run to Lowe's, and I've got to go to the cash register, and I had to wait for someone to show up. Well, now they've got vending machines outside of the Wawa by me. And I can take my can, I can, the, the interface is terrible. There's a lot that they can improve on this, but this is such a big innovation. I am so excited about this. You can literally go get gas outside of the Wawa at two in the morning, which may, may, maybe that's not a great idea, but they, <laughs> they figured out how to do this and, it, and it's amazing. So for years, I ran a really large um, system within a, a big enterprise. And when we started, what we were working to do was to replace a vendor system that was costing us a lot of money and not really serving the needs of the business. And in order to get rid of the vendor system as quickly as possible and not have to pay for a renewal, we rushed our system out the door without building self-service tools. We said to ourselves, we'll migrate everyone over, then we'll have this nice lull, and we'll be able to build a wonderful self-service system and what happened instead is that when we rolled out our system, people said, oh, this doesn't suck as much as the last system did. We'd like to use it. And so things started growing like crazy. We had 500% year-on-year growth for like five years in a row. And <laughs> it was really hard to build those self-service tools because we did not anticipate that, right? Um, but what we were able to do in the end was... Um, find ways to like slowly imp incrementally deliver self-service. So initially we had built a fairly complete self-service system. We were about to roll it out. It was gonna make all of our lives easier. We were gonna be able to innovate the core platform. Very excited about it. And then about a week before we rolled it out, we spotted a significant security flaw in the plan that would allow people to kind of hijack other people's services. Seemed like a bad thing. So we, we had to go back to the drawing board. I had a really smart engineer on my team who, after a couple of weeks of the disappointment setting in, finally realized we had built this front end tool. One of the problems that we had with the, um, the, the system before self-service is that we handled it through ticketing. So someone would, for example, fill out uh, the questions that we would ask, uh, we'd ask, how many requests per second do you need? And people would say lots. And lots is a really hard number to implement in a finite system. Um, 
And so you enter the delay of communication back and forth about what do you mean by lots? What does that mean? Um, and it would turn out they meant like five requests per second. And we'd say, oh, <laughs> we don't think that's lots, but okay, no problem. Um, so it would just take a long time and a lot of follow-up and a lot of manual communication that just sucked time away from our engineers because every time they're doing that, there's that context switching tax that you pay. So this engineer's insight was, hey, we built this self-service system. We have a front end that guides people through all the correct answers. It, it keeps them from entering lots for requests per second, right? It, it gives us information that we need to properly provision a service. And so then we were able to just redirect the back end of that front end to open a JIRA ticket for us. And turning that on meant that we had all the information every time that we needed to provision a service. And that freed the time for us to then go and build the proper self-service system that did the validations to make sure that everyone was secure. It was a, a huge insight. And eventually we were able to move away from ticketing altogether into like a just-in-time support model, which is a great way to operate. If you can get rid of tickets, get rid of tickets. Um, the next rule is WTFM. For those who aren't familiar with RTFM, this stands for write the frequently overlooked but very necessary manual. Um, if you're going to build a self-service system, people are going to need to how, understand how to operate it. If you're really good at UI design, which if you're a back-end platform engineering team, that may not be the skill that you're necessarily prior, prioritizing when you hire. Um, if you're really good at that, you might be able to build a self-documenting system that guides people through the information that they need to use your system. But chances are, at some point, they're going to need to go and read, their doc read your documentation. And look, I've worked with a lot of engineers. I think I know one that actually likes writing documentation. <laughs> um, it's not everyone's favorite thing, but writing good documentation is a lot better than dealing with people who don't understand how to use your system because your documentation is terrible. Um, we came up with a really helpful rule on our team. If you have a self-service system, the correct answer for how do I use this is always go read the documentation. Um, that's the whole point of self-service is we're not here to provide you white glove onboarding. But we modified that a little bit in our team. And the, way, the rule that we came up with was that's always the right answer. But before you give that answer, stop a second. We use Slack primarily for support. And what we asked our engineers to do is actually read the question and put yourself as much as you can in that person's shoes. Think about what they're asking. What are, what are they likely thinking in the question that they're asking us? Not what do we think they're thinking, because we understand our system really, really well. We're the experts. We built the thing. Um, but what are they really getting at? And then read the documentation yourself and see if it answers that question before you point them at the manual. <laughs> And what we found was we almost always had a small tweak to make after doing that exercise, right? It was never, we need to rewrite our documentation, but it was, oh, this doesn't cover this really important aspect of what this customer is asking. And so we were able to follow up with them and say, hey, here's the general documentation about the thing you're asking to do, but here's some specific context to your question that you don't have in the documentation. And then even better, hopefully within the next week or so, sometimes within a day, we would submit a pull request that, to our markdown that addressed that point. And we'd hit that customer back up and ask them, hey, would you mind looking over these changes that we're recommending and see if they make our documentation more helpful for you? Does this, would this be better documentation for you? And you can really build great relationships with your stakeholders when you do that and make it easier for the next user to follow along. All right, just say no. <laughs> this is easier to say than to do, perhaps. I've certainly worked at organizations where it's incredibly hard to say no, 
And uh, this is generally something that, an attitude that comes from the top down, and those attitudes can be hard to fight. Um, so this, this picture here, this is a white-bearded gnu. Um, famously, Hemingway described this animal, saying this uh, is an animal apparently designed by committee and assembled from spare parts. And what I really love about the gnu, um, I don't know how many people are into like collective nouns. Animals have these great names as collective groups, so like murder of crows. Um, does anyone know what a group of white-bearded gnus are called? Wildebeest sometimes. Um, as a group, they're called an improbability. It's just fantastic and very real. Um, so if you're working in an organization where saying no to additional work that's being demanded by management isn't something you can easily do, you're going to have to work hard on this, right? You're going to have to justify why you're saying no to new priorities that are randomly being thrown at you. And you're going to have to work to understand why those priorities are being thrown at you, because maybe they're really important to the business. And you do need to go and deliver them. But if you're able to say, hey, here are our current list of priorities. What do you want us to get rid of to go and do this thing you're asking us to do? Um, you, can, you can stop a lot of that sort of cruft from building up in your system. We would get all the time asked, hey, you know, we have this really important initiative going on in the company. And we want you to go build this very special feature that's going to take weeks of engineering, and you're going to have to support it for forever, and it's going to represent less than a tenth of a percent of your overall traffic. Now, is that a worthwhile investment? It's probably not. There's probably something that's going to impact 40% of our customers that we can go and build, and going to management and pointing that out. And uh, having that conversation is so important. You have to remember that. Every time you say yes instead of no, you're actually saying no to a whole bunch of work that last week you thought was really important and we're planning on doing. And trust me, you do not want to own an improbability of technical debt. It's the worst. All right, uh, measure how people use the system. This sounds really obvious. If you're an internal platform engineering team, it can be difficult to get this done. Um, there's a ton of tooling to make this easy if you've got a UI. A lot of that, because it's HTTP based, can be applied to APIs as well and give you tons of useful data. But it, you don't need to do that. If you don't have the, the time to go and build the measurement into your system, maybe you inherited something that didn't have that measurement there, there are still ways you can figure out how users are using your system. Um, one of my favorite techniques was to go through, again, we use Slack for support engineering. We went to a ticketless system. People just come into Slack, ask us a question. We address it as quickly as we can, and we move on to the next thing. That means that our, our ticketing database is essentially our Slack channel's history. And as a manager, I would periodically go through there and just manually read through the history and categorize issues that had come up. Where, what part of the system were they asking about? Um, were there call-outs where there was a lot of friction in our system? Were there parts of our system that were working not the way people expected them to? And just by doing simple counting, we were able to reprioritize our work to address the areas that were actually causing developers in the rest of our, uh, our enterprise friction. And that is a really powerful thing to be able to do Combined with measuring like how people are using the system, you can come to some really useful insights. All right, watch your customers use your product. So I hear a couple giggles. I'm assuming most of you have seen this video. If you haven't, this is the developer watching the QA team here uh, completely misuse the system. So if you're I, I do know some people didn't grow up with this toy, but this toy is a simple child's toy. You get a shape, you get like that arch, and you stick the arch in the, in the arch-shaped hole, and you learn about shapes, and you learn about tactile interfaces, and you know it's really good for developing minds. But um, it turns out you can shove everything in the same hole, and that's what this 
QA tester is doing. And if you've ever worked with a really good QA engineer, this captures pretty well what that feels like. Um, so Kelsey Hightower tweeted uh, a couple of years ago that he was really excited because he was about to run a customer empathy workshop for Kubernetes. He didn't really explain what that meant, and uh, I had no idea what it meant, but like every engineer, I said, that sounds really interesting, so I'm going to make up my own idea of what that means, and I'm going to try it. And I talked to a whole bunch of people, uh, some of whom are in the room and got a lot of feedback, and we built a process. What we would do is find a sister engineering team, an engineering team that was working on a very similar process, and we'd trade doing this. And in fact, uh, I see M's in the room today. Uh, they were our first uh, victim of this experiment. And what we would do is we would ask someone who was not familiar with our system to try to implement it while we all watched. And then in trade, we'd try to use their, all system, their system while they all watched. And I'm pretty sure anyone who was a tester for that would attest that they felt horribly self-conscious. They felt like they didn't understand how to use the system. Um, it, it can be a really humbling experience if you want to increase your humility, like Matt was talking about yesterday. This is a great experience. But I can tell you for all of my engineers, no one thought anyone was doing a bad job using our system. We were busy cringing at how obviously terrible our system was that we had built and were so proud of. Um, a, a great concrete example is that when we developed the system, we were, uh, everything in the company was internal. Um, we didn't really use external cloud providers and everyone in the company knew all of our data centers by the weird names that we call our data centers, right? And a few years down the line, it turned out that most of our engineers were using public cloud infrastructure. And it turns out that BRP07 doesn't really tell someone who's not familiar with our data center naming conventions what the heck that means. Like, where do I want to deploy my application? Do I want BRP07 or QRX32? I don't know, right? Um, and so just really simple and in retrospect, very ob obvious observations came out of that. Just an incredibly powerful thing if you can do one thing on your team that really brings the ideas of product management to your team. I can't recommend anything else more than this simple idea. So the last recommendation I have, and again, this is very much a platform engineering team sort of recommendation, is actually build a plan to accommodate future growth. So I think most platform engineering teams are really focused on the problem of will people use our system or how will we get people to use our system? And I've lived through the opposite problem, which is what happens when too many people end up using our system? And we didn't have this conversation, right? If you were at a startup and you experienced 500% year-on-year growth six years in a row, then your investors would be throwing engineers at that problem, right? That's what they want to see. They want the company to grow. They want the product to grow. They want more and more people to continue to use it. If you're a cost center in a large enterprise, that is not the way your management is thinking. And I can tell you um, I'm very fortunate to have worked with engineers as smart as the engineers who have worked on my system over the years were because we had 2% year-on-year growth for staffing at the same time as we had that 500% year-on-year growth for usage. Um, and that can be rough. In retrospect, I really wish I had sat down with my management, and I've learned to do this in the, uh, since then, to have a conversation about when we achieve this milestone, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask for more AWS funding because I'm going to need to more widely distribute this application, make it more redundant, make it higher availability. When I hit this point, thank you, I'm going to need to come to you and ask for more staffing. And look, in most, in most large enterprises, that's not a guarantee that you're going to get those concessions down the road when the time comes, but you can at least get recognition of why those concessions are necessary and accommodations for 
what compromises need to be made as a result of not being able to fund the, the additional staffing or the additional capacity that you need to continue to operate the system. Um, so this is my kind of last rule, last bit of advice. So like all of DevOps, these rules are really, especially this last one, right? It is about people, it is about sustainable engineering, and that's really why we're here, right? That's what Dev the DevOps movement is about and being able to take care of your team and make sure that the people who have worked hard to build your successful system are well taken care of themselves is really the best thing you can do. So I think we have like two, three minutes. If there are any questions I can take real quick. If not, you can chase me down at lunch or in the afternoon. <laughs> 